uh, you already corrected. Look, if I say Sunday's the first, you're supposed to say the calendar's wrong, the pastor's right. What is wrong with you? You got We're going to have a lesson on loyalty tonight. And I don't understand. My wife's over there saying it is so the first. It is so the first. My husband's never wrong. And uh, anyway, if you believe that, it's because she's drunk. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> Uh, we're gonna we're gonna run through some things here. I love the book of Proverbs. I would urge you to read it, think about it, talk about it. And um, as we go through Proverbs, let me just take a moment and preface where we're going tonight. This book, obviously, it's God's word. It was written before Solomon was born. It was forever settled in heaven. Psalms 119 tells us. So uh, I remember being in college, the wrong college, before I heard of Brother Hiles and Hiles Anderson. And um, I was sitting in a theology class, and, and the guy said, well, most people believe Hebrews was written by Paul because of the writing style. And, and he talked about Peter's workbook, uh, First and Second Peter, had not as uh, sophisticated a grammar because he was a fisherman, and Paul, being very educated, the Pauline epistles have much uh, a higher caliber of grammar. And I'm a young enough Christian, and I'm thinking, I kind of think God wrote that, pal. And if God wants to write sophisticated or street language, I believe God took his word and wrote it, and then he took a man and made that man to match the word of God. God didn't take uh, a man and say, here's my ideas, you put it in your own words. It's not there. The Bible is not God's ideas in man's words. Um, so... Um, I understand and uh, forever I've believed that God's word was from God uh, before men were born to men, but God, God uses men. And that's what we're talking about here before we get started in Proverbs 4. God chose to use Solomon. Now we all understand Solomon um, was a mess. His mother was Bathsheba, who got into a relationship with David probably through no choice of her own. We don't know that, but that would be assumed. And David, when the, the, the time when kings go forth to war, so David should have been in battle, but he's at home, he's on the rooftop, hanging around, and he sees Bathsheba um, bathing, and whatever the circumstances are, is irrelevant. The fact the scripture, David saw her and asked somebody, who is that gal, go get her for me. Men are aroused by their sight. And uh, a child is conceived, and the child, um, David finds out about it, so he arranges the murder of Uriah, one of his faithful soldiers, in order to cover his sin. And Uriah dies. David takes Bathsheba as wife, and now he thinks, I got away with it. Let me explain something. You don't get away with it. I read this morning, um, I don't know what I read this morning, asked my son, what, what did we read this morning, Josiah? We read how there was a famine for three years in Israel, and David went to God and said, why is the famine here? And he said, because Saul was trying to kill the Gibeonites. And if you remember, the Gibeonites came into the forefront when Joshua came into the land of Canaan, and Joshua was tricked and the elders were tricked and so they made a covenant to allow Gibeah to live among them even though they should have been destroyed. Now I'm not Mr. Brilliant on chronology and all but I know this, the time of the judges was 400 years. So we've got the story of Joshua and then judges and then we get into the kings after the judges so we've got the time Joshua, Joshua made a covenant and there were years. How many years? 10, 20, 30 years? We don't know. I could probably figure it out. You could probably figure it out, but don't do it now. <clears throat> we've got 400 years for the, prof, for the judges and then the time of King Saul's reign and then the time of David's reign. And it's toward the end of the Israel. We're looking at probably 500 years since an agreement was made and Saul broke that agreement. And God said, the land is cursed. 
because of Saul and what went wrong, and God solved that. And so when we think about um, Solomon and the situation we come into here, writing in Solomon, Solomon thought he could cover his sin. Uh, Saul thought he got away with the improper treatment of the Gibeonites. Saul was uh, doing wrong and killed the Gibeonites. The whole country suffered because of Saul's wrongdoing. But that didn't mean God was done with Israel. God was chastening them and then God was working things out. The same with Solomon. And we look here, um, Solomon was the son of David and Bathsheba, the second child, the first baby died. And here Solomon is, the next child. Uh, David thought he was gonna get away with it. He thought he had his sin covered. And the preacher comes along and this famous line, thou art the man. And so the baby dies and, and David and Bathsheba are married. Their first child conceived in adultery dies. And, and now another son comes along. Well, it's a, it's a broken play. The relationship started wrong. The first child was literally taken to heaven by God in judgment. And then God gave him Solomon. Now the point of this is, yes, sin is punished, but understand, God's only working with broken plays. God doesn't have any perfect plays to work with. God doesn't have anybody that he says, I'm going to use you because you have never messed up. All God works with is sinners. Now, yes, we should grieve over our sin. We should turn from our sin. We should seek to do right. But as we look at, at uh, Solomon and how God used Solomon in the, in the scriptures here, understand Solomon, if he were to talk about his, you know, hey, how'd your mom and dad meet? Well, let's don't talk about it. Um, you know, are you the firstborn? No. As a matter of fact, there's multiple women. And the whole thing's a big mess back in those days. But, but as we look at this, I just want to remind you, we're, we're not dealing with perfect people here. We're dealing with a perfect God who says, you yield your life to me, I'll use you. Now, in the latter part of Solomon's life, he made a mess of things. And God removed his hand and Solomon got bitter and Solomon got vindictive and vengeful and, and Solomon messed everything up. Um, but the fact is, God used Solomon greatly. And don't, don't think that your life doesn't matter because of some event in the past. Be more focused on what you're doing in your present. Be more focused on yielding to God, surrendering to God, and admitting, you know, if you can use a shoe to drive a nail, God, all be the shoe. But we're just frail vessels tonight. And as we look at this, uh, you know, sometimes when you, you read some instruction to parents, a parent thinks, oh, have I ever messed up? Yes, and so have I, and so has every other parent. You know, if I did things right, my kids would be good. Yeah, like Adam and Eve, because their father was so good. Um, you know, we're just really here at the mercy of God trying to yield our lives to God to do his will. So follow me. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 4. We're going to hurry through a few things here. Uh, Hear, ye children, the instruction of a father and attend to no understanding. Now, the burden is on the child. And I talked a little bit about this before a couple of weeks ago. But to bring us back up to date, the burden's on the kid. Hear, ye children, the instruction of a father. It doesn't say, dads, be so creative, be so dynamic, be so um, charismatic in your personality that your kids just run to you to listen. It doesn't say that. It says, hey, you kids, you're idiots, listen to your daddy. Simple as that. Hear ye children the instruction of a father, and attend to no understanding. I give you good doctrine, forsake ye not my law. Uh, For I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. And so... If we look at this, this in a timeline, Solomon saying to his children and about his father, he said, I was my father's son, and I listened to my father, and now I want you to listen to me, and I want you to pay attention as I teach you these things. And the decision is up to the kids whether they're going to listen to the dad or not. And you young ladies and young men here tonight, um, you've got two options. You can look back to those 
who've gone before you and listen, whether it be your mom or your dad or your grandparents or your pastor or youth director or Sunday school teacher, godly people in your life that, that you look to, you can look to them and listen to them or you can listen to your friends and yourself. That's the only two choices. Now, what I would do is consider your friends and consider you and think how much wisdom and experience they have. And then I'd look back at dad or, or any of the godly older people in your life. Or it's not always a father. In some cases, it's, a, it's a, somebody else in your spiritual word. could be a pastor. could be a, an uncle or a grandpa or whoever. But look, look at those spiritual people older than you, further down the line, and you'd ask yourself, what is the safest path to follow? It's as simple as that. Who is likely, you say, well, they're not perfect. Yeah, like you and your friends are at 14 or at 24. Who is more likely to have a better grasp on things? And so he says, hear my children, the instruction of a father, attend to no understanding, for I give you good doctrine. Now follow me. He says, I am giving you something that's good. It's time tested. It's proven. And you young men that are going to be someday in some kind of ministry and off in Bible college, let me just, just uh, tell you, when, when I got saved, and I, had, I was at a university, and so I had no older influence. I got saved on Wednesday, Saturday I left for college, and all that was around me was, I mean, the older Christians were 17 and 19 and 20, and we were all young. Then I met my pastor up in Reading, and I listened. He'd been in the ministry... He's 30 years older than me. He had been in the ministry 25 years when I got saved. He knew some things. And then I started getting Brother Hiles' cassette. Some of you that are old enough to know what a cassette is. And, um, you know, we didn't download anything. Uh, to download means you took the bales of hay out of the truck and you downloaded them to a conveyor, carrying them up into the barn. And uh, we listened to a godly mother, to a godly father, to a godly pastor. And we, we listened. And uh, he said, I was my father's son in verse 3, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. But let me just give you a thought. For 33 years, the philosophies that we believe have helped marriages, helped young people, and sent off, we don't even know how many, to Bible college and off in the ministry. And so I say, I took what... Brother Hiles gave us, and as best as I knew how, have tried to implement those things, frail and imperfect, but tried. And to the young men here, and to you young ladies, I say, we've handed down something to you that you have watched for 30 years, some of you. It really has worked. Yes. The old time religion works. And you say, well, it doesn't move me like the contemporary rock and rollers. No, we're not trying to move you. We're trying to change you. We're trying to change your world. We're trying to change a nation. We're trying to influence people. I was texting back and forth with Micah Bull today. Um, you know, Mike is, he's just a great guy. And he's dating a really cute girl. So pray she doesn't get her eyesight back. And, and I got this cute girl he met on tour up in Canada. And... He'll be marching at Howells Anderson graduation in a few weeks, and, and uh, two weeks, I guess. And, and uh, you, know, our, you know, our young people are getting, they're planning on going to the mission field. It's a great thing. Our young people are planning on going to the ministry. Now, whatever it is that was given to me, and whatever it is that I gave to you young people, I would like to say this, I give you good doctrine. I'm giving you the good stuff. It really does work. In, I'm not saying we don't have hurt in our church. I'm not saying we don't have some heartaches. But I'll tell you, it's a pretty phenomenal place. And the whole thing may fall apart next Sunday. And God may kill me. And if he does, I'll be better off than you. Because <laughs> uh, I know where I'm going. But, but it's, Solomon said to his son Rehoboam, look, I'm giving you good doctrine time tested proven this is good stuff and by the way i could say to all the young people in here what we're giving you is what produced you 
I'm always, uh, it's always interesting to me when I, I read, and I rarely do, but someone sometimes will send me something and there'll be some blog online somewhere and some guy writes these, you know, like I remember some months ago, I, I, somebody sent me an article, redefining fundamentalism. I thought, well, number one, you don't have to redefine what's already been defined. Now, if you just want to say I'm no longer a fundamental Baptist, that's fine. You know, God, we're, we're in America. Isn't it great to be free? But don't say you're going to redefine us because what we are produced you. Yeah. Yeah. And so I started checking the, the anti-fundamental Baptist bloggers. All of them came from a church like ours. All of them. Most of them graduated from Hiles Anderson. And so what they're saying is, I don't like me. But I'd like you to listen to me. Now, if they're not what they should be, you should not listen to them. Does that make sense? And if they are anything of value whatsoever, maybe they ought to pay attention who trained them. To the Sunday school teachers who taught them. To the families, to the pastor, to the Christian school, most of the, most of the, the, the big mouth people who write blogs instead of going soul winning, um, they... You know, they wouldn't have time to write nearly as much if they'd run bus routes in Sunday school and things like they're supposed to be doing. But, um, but he said, I give you good doctrine, and these guys have been trained and, and turned out for God. Why would they say, you know what? Man, all this that put me where I am, put me in the ministry, gave me my wife, gave me my family, gave me my life. Uh, all of their wives came from fundamental Baptist backgrounds. I'm not being critical of our own, but I saw Caleb and Beth Beal here. Caleb and Beth Beal, a pretty amazing couple. You know where they came from? Fundamental Baptist Church. Amen. He had to leave here to get a wife because the girls here knew him too well, but, but it's all right. They wish they'd have got you now, Caleb. You're awesome. <laughs> no, they don't. That would be bad to, to wish that way, but you know what I mean. They all admire you with a godly respect. <laughs> But see, that's what Solomon's saying to his son. Hey, what I gave you has worked. You know what I gave you? I gave you a separated, soul winning, no drinking, no movies, uh, no worldly dress, no, no worldly activities. Stay clean, stay right kind of Christianity. I'm giving you the good stuff. Now hang in there with it. Will we stumble? Absolutely. Somebody going to drop the ball and spend a week, a month, a year in, in Stupidville? Of course. Sometimes multiple years, and I, we don't need to get amens there. But, uh, yeah, we're going to do dumb things. Uh, you know what? I love what I see in our young people so much that I refuse to change where we've been and what we are. And Jamie Card back here about to get married, going to forsake her father's name. <laughs> I like Jamie. I like her enough to say I'm going to keep doing what we've done in the last 21 years in her life. That's how much I like Jamie. And that's what Solomon's talking about here. He says, here, here, listen. Verse 2, I give you good doctrine. Don't forsake my law. I was my father's son, and, and what he gave was passed down to me. Verse 4, he taught me also and said, let your heart retain my words. Hang on to this thing. Sure, you got hurt along the way. Yes, there's some difficulties. Yes, there's some battles. But you're in the right place, and you got the right stuff. Cling to it. Verse 5, get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not. Again, the burden is on the young person to go clamor after it, to go hunger for it, to reach out for it. And one of the dangers in our world today, and I taught our young people in, in a Christian philosophy class, we've got, uh, this is a review for you in my philosophy class, but here is a mic with too short a cord. Does this cordless work in here? Yes, sir. You sure? All right, it's got a little red light. Here's a young person gets saved. Um, they, they start out in our church. They were born in our church. I mean, when the Beals came, I mentioned Caleb. Caleb and Carrie were, came to our church just brand new, newborn kids. And Brett was two or something like that. And um, so they come to our church. And they're immature. They're little babies. I remember when Kayla and, Bren, uh, Kayla and Megan were newborn, problems to their mother. Brenna was wonderful. But... And, but um, you know, they're, they're immature. They need to be fed. They need to 
play, they need to be taken care of, everything is about them. You know why? Because they're babies, because they're immature. And we've made it a goal of our church to get people trained to serve. And so whether it be teen choir, or special music, or children's ministries, or TNT, or bus routes, or whatever, uh, our goal, we rest homes, door-to-door -door work, to take the young people group here and we teach them to serve, and we teach them to serve, and we teach them to serve. And when they get to that point where they are servants that don't even need supervised, you know what we call them? Mature. So they start out immature, babies, and they mature in their Christian life. And I love that I can give bus routes away to former children in our ministry and give away Sunday school classes or jail or rest home ministries or whatever because now they are mature and they know because they know how to live for others. Now the sad thing is that some young people, they get to college and they get a husband and wife, usually the opposite of what they are, and um, they get married and they're really happy about life and now they play because I got a house I got a job I got money and I can smooch all I want this is awesome and they don't want to commit to a choir or to a Sunday school class or a bus route and they have completed the circle they're now back here. Immature. All about me. That is the contemporary church movement today. It's all about me. What's wrong with drinking a little? What's wrong with some rock and roll? What's wrong with the movies? What's wrong with the dances? Hey, what's wrong with teaching a Sunday school class? Let's ask that question. What's wrong with running a bus route? What's wrong with holiness? And Solomon's saying, look, I gave you good doctrine. He said down there in verse 7, uh, or verse 5, he said, get wisdom. It's your job. You get understanding. For, look at the next line there in verse 5, forget it not. Don't get down the road and forget what we taught you because it's good stuff. That's what made you happy as a teenager. Hey, do you know what? You know what made you attractive to your spouse or you young people that are in high school now going off to college in the next couple of years? You know what's going to make you attractive to your spouse? They're going to see the way you work on buses or see the way you work in Sunday school or see the way you're involved in ministry and they're going to fall in love with you because of your love for God and your love for them, of course, and all that. And then when you stop serving God, you just tore out part of what they fell in love with. And sometimes you got to make this circle and then you got to think, you know what? Man, I need to get back where I was. And, and, and you step back in and get on track with choir or special music or buses or Sunday school or something. And, and you know what's great? It's God doesn't say, where have you been? Isn't God awesome? He just says, man, good to see you. Got a spot for you right over here. What a wonderful God, isn't he? He says in verse 5, get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not, don't forget, neither decline from the words of my mouth, forsake her not. So notice, when we get away from the things that were committed to us by our fathers, it's we who forsake what our fathers taught us. And he's pushing this matter of wisdom in verse 7. Wisdom is the principal thing. You've got to get wisdom with all you're getting. Now understand, if God's urging and urging, saying, you have got to get it, it's not easy to get. Do you realize if God says over and over and over, attend to this, pay attention to that, uh, seek this, don't forsake it, get a hold of it, seek it as silver, search for it as for hidden treasure, it's probably pretty easy to not have wisdom. It's the most natural thing in the world to go through life and like, like holding water in a leaky glass to have all the things that have been committed to you. It's so natural to have it all slip out. And we have got to cling to this stuff. 
you adults, I'm going to just urge you, spend time in your Bible. Spend time listening to preaching. Rarely, I don't know when a day goes by, I don't listen to preaching. Now, I'll go so far as to say you should listen to preaching before you listen to Rush Limbaugh. I mean, that's way out there. If you say, who's Rush Limbaugh? I'd say, God bless you. <laughs> Going down to verse 10. I'm sorry, verse 8 and 9, there's a reward that comes when you cling to the wisdom and to the instruction of your fathers. Verse 8, exalt her and she shall promote thee. She shall bring thee to honor. You'll get promotion. You'll get honor. Verse 9, she'll give you an ornament of grace and a crown of glory. I know we talked about this some last week, but I've had it or two weeks ago. We had a whole different angle on this tonight. Uh, verse 10, hear, O my son, listen, and the years of thy life shall be many. Isn't it some? God says, if you'll pay attention, you'll have a longer life. You'll have a more productive life. You'll have a crown of glory. You'll have all these wonderful things. But it all comes back to what are you going to do with the, tr with the training of your fathers? promise you this, there's not a 14-year-old or a 17-year-old here that knows what you need to know to make decisions in life. I just read recently, um, and I wish I could tell you who it was, but he said, you need to live on the convictions of your father or your church until you are old enough and strong enough to hold those convictions all by yourself. Not to go get your own convictions, but to to embrace them and make them your own. And so you're 14, 16, 18, 19, 20 years old. If you go to Bible college and you say, this is what my pastor taught me, that'll do. If you're a junior in high school and someone says, why do you do that? You say, you know what, because I trust my mom. That's a good thing. Yes. Nothing wrong with that. It's all right for you to cling to your parents' faith while you're slowly getting the Word of God into you where it becomes your own. There's nothing wrong with that. Eventually, it does have to become your own because somewhere along up the way up here, um, you don't know when your leaders are going to change or your leaders are going to be gone, and it's got to become your faith. But, but make it yours and make it something you embrace. That's why this thing, we talked about going from immature and being entertained to learning to serve and serving somewhere along the line here and just become a servant. Just say, I am going to serve the people of God. There's nothing better. Nothing better than serving the people of God. Quickly, verse 11, I've taught you in the way of wisdom. I've led you in the right paths. So... What you received, you were shown the right path, you were led in the right path. Verse 12, when you go and thou goest, thy steps shall not be straightened. When thou runnest, thou shalt not stumble. If you will stay and I will stay in the path. Look, here I am at, at this age, at this age, I don't know what age this is, but at 58 years old, I could change my path. But where would I go? Who would I follow? I just, I know a guy, um, some of you know, some of one of his relatives, but he was, he pastored one of the fastest growing churches in Florida 30 years ago when I started here. And a very, very successful, strong, soul winning Baptist church. And, 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 I, and I just, I never heard his name again, gone, absolutely off the radar. And then I found out he came to Southern California because I met his brother. And I said to his brother, I said, well, you know, I, I've heard your brother on cassettes and I'd heard him speak and I heard about his great church. I said, where is he now? He said, he came into LA and this really rich, well-established church brought him in to be their pastor. The day he, they voted him in, they gave him tens of thousands of dollars to redecorate the office and the buildings and he gave him, they just gave him tons and tons of money. And he said, I went to my brother and asked him, what are you doing here? There's no soul winning. There's no outreach. There's no bus ministry. There's no old-fashioned preaching. There's no holiness. What are you doing here? He said, you know what? I spent most of my ministry fighting the battle in Florida. And he said, I'm done fighting. I'm just tired. And he traded the fight for convenience. I'm not going to be anybody's judge, but I don't want to quit. And I love Brother Hiles, 
and he right up to the last week or two before he went to heaven he stood and I, I couldn't I, I don't know what path I'd follow who knows what ruin I would find so he says in verse 13 take fast hold of instruction let her not go he says you you have got to grab a hold of what you're being taught and never let go of it hang on to it for all your worth and you might say well you know I've dropped the ball here there some things went wrong all right some things went wrong grab a hold of instruction today reach back beyond your your wayward days weeks months years and grab what you were trained and embrace it and make it your own or take what you've been taught and hang on to it god never looks back at your your time of uh, of folly god looks at your today and and he says hang on to that thing don't let it go one of the dumbest things I could think of is getting married and starting off into life without God. And so he warns um, in verse 13, take fast hold of instruction, let her not go. Keep her. Why? Because she is your life. America would be way, way, way better off if we would go back to the 50s and the 40s and start grabbing some great leaders and say, teach me. Instead, we've got craziness all over the place. I'm glad we've got God, and I'm glad we've got a faithful father. The warning, the encouragement, just in kind of reviewing tonight, uh, I want to encourage all of us. I don't think I'm so old I can't look to the old people. I mean, I look to Brother Beal all the time. I want to trust the gray heads in our church. And I'm certainly going to trust the gray heads in my ministry. I thank God for technology because uh, this last week I was listening to Harold Seitler. If you've never heard Harold Seitler, and old Harold Seitler at Tabernacle Baptist Church, what a guy. Everybody ought to listen to him. And, and he's been in heaven for many years now. But I go back to the, the faith of our fathers. And I don't want to let it go. And I want that, I just want every bit of, now to get Harold Seitler, you've got to have a drunkard's voice. He's got this old grovelly southern, I don't know what, how you describe Harold Seitler, there's nobody quite like him unless it's Sharon O'Brien. And <laughs> she's, she's got that, that uh, grovelly outspokenness like Harold Seitler, but don't tell her I said that, she's not here tonight. I shouldn't tease Sharon, I look over and she's not there. So I didn't say that, we're going to take that off the tape. Okay, but uh, let's hang on tight. All right, let's pray. Father, bless us as we go and as we think about how good you've been and all that you've given us and how you've led us safely through the decades. Lord, may we cling to the paths, the faith of our fathers living still. And I pray for our young adults, our married couples, young married couples and the kids, the teenagers here. But they might realize what got me here is a pretty safe thing. And um, what brought me safe this far is what will keep me safe the rest of the way. And for those who on occasion have slipped and stumbled along the way, thank you, Father, that you always pick us up. You always give us uh, that bright welcome as we walk in the light. Help us, help our church. Help the ministry here, help these next days to be times when we'll step up and be encouraged and, and vibrant in our faith. Father, bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Oh, you, God bless you. Next week, we'll raise $3,000. <laughs>